Amen. So moving right along through the book of 2 Timothy, we're in chapter 2 tonight. And, you know, if I were to give a title besides just 2 Timothy chapter 2 to this um, chapter, I would call it Faithfulness and Focus in the Face of Adversity. And really, that's what uh, we see uh, as being, uh, Timothy is being admonished to do in this chapter. Paul is admonishing him to remain faithful. He's admonishing him to remain focused, all in the face of adversity against tribulation, against uh, you know, the hardness that comes with living the Christian life. And as we read through that, you'll see that tonight. Uh, there in, for, uh, in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Thou therefore, my son... And if you recall, we talked about last week uh, how, how that was a term of endearment for Paul towards Timothy, where he calls him my son. He referred to him as my son in the faith. So, of course, this isn't his physical son, but it's one that he brought up in the faith. And that was the nature of the relationship, was a father and son one. It was that close. He goes on and says, Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be uh, able to teach others also. So what we see here, first of all, is that in order for the ministry to grow, right? Because that's what Paul's desire is here. He wants Paul or he wants Timothy to be able to commit the same things that he's taught him to other faithful men who will then be able in turn to teach others also. So you can see that the, the, the desire, the intent that Paul had was that the ministry would grow, that it wouldn't just be this, you know, us for no more kind of thing. And that's the same attitude we ought to have today. Amen. You know, and, and people sometimes they get weird about you know, if a church gets too big, they'll say the church is too big and they always want to be in a small congregation and they don't, and they want this just very exclusive, just kind of, uh, you know, um, a group of people where they just want to cap it. But that's not what Paul wants. You know, Paul wants, he wants Timothy to do the job and teach other men also who will be able to teach other men also. He wants more churches. He wants bigger churches. And uh, there's nothing wrong with a big church, you know, and there's nothing wrong with a small church either. I mean, the Lord builds the church, you know, and if you were in a smaller area uh, where, where, you know, that's just the way it is, then that's fine too. But our attitude should never be, it has to stay small, you know. And I've seen people quit churches, good, great churches, because th they just felt like it got too big, you know, and they felt like, well, it's too impersonal. Well, you know, when a church grows to 300 people, you know, of course there's going to be some element of it feeling a little impersonal. But church isn't a social club. You know, we don't go there so we can just make ourselves feel good about you know, all the great friends that we developed. I mean, we should have friendships, but you don't have to be friends with every single person in the church. So we should never develop this attitude where, you know, it's too big, uh, I don't, I feel left out or whatever. If you're feeling left out in a church of any size, it's probably because you're not doing what you need to do to involve yourself in the ministry and to, uh, you know, develop those friendships. So that's important. And that's the attitude that Paul has here. He wants the church to continue to grow. He wants more churches. But in order for that to happen, we as individuals have to be strong for the battle. That's what he tells them there. He says, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then he tells them, you know, and, and the things that thou hast uh, heard of me among many witnesses is the same commit to others also. So yeah, he wants the church to grow. He wants other men to, to, to take on the, the, the role and other ministries to be started. But, you know, it starts with Timothy having to determine for himself that he's going to be strong that is in, the, in, in the grace that is in uh, Christ Jesus. And that's what we have to do in order for uh, our ministry to grow, in order for other ministries to be started, for any ministry to grow, <clears throat> the people within that ministry first themselves have to be strong. They have to be established. They have to be rooted in the faith. <clears throat> now, you say, well, why, what's so important about being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus? Why is that so important? Well, because the Christian life is not a bed of roses. The Christian life is not just this walk through the lilies on our way to heaven, you know, you know, it, it is struggle. If you're, if you're really living the Christian life, it's struggle, it's work, it's, it, it can be even in some places, in some instances, perilous. I mean, it can be physically endangering in some places right. and in certain times throughout history. You know, it, it, it's not just this, people get this wrong idea that it's, it's just going to be just peachy keen their whole life. Now, I'm not saying, you know, that the Christian life is you having to sleep on a bed of nails every night and, you know, and, it going, and it's nothing but hardness, but... <clears throat> there is definitely an element of difficulty to living the Christian life. I mean, just think about it. You have to war against your flesh. You know, your, the old man hasn't gone away. Right. We still, the old man still rears his ugly head, still has his desires, still wants to fight the spirit every step of the way. Then you got the world, which is full of antichrists, which lieth in wickedness, the Bible says, that wants to pull us away from Christ. You got the devil. 
You got his his minions, his servants that are they're doing his bidding, trying to you know trip up Christians and make it difficult to to live the Christian life. So there's a lot going against us spiritually and even sometimes even physically. So <clears throat> that's why we have to be strong. I mean, look at the language that was used here. He says, you know, be strong, uh, and he goes on and says, thou therefore endure hardness, right? And he says, no man that warreth. Right? We have to strive. We have to labor. We have to suffer trouble. We have to endure. These are, these are serious, heavy words that he's using. And he's trying to warn him that you need to be strong. Why? Because all, there is going to be all these things. There is going to be hardness, warring, striving, laboring. That's the Christian life. And that's what it takes for ministries to grow. And that's what it takes for uh, the word of God to go forth in the world. So the Christian life is one of hardness. And the Christian life requires us, as Christians, to have a mindset of a soldier. I mean, that's the example he uses there in verse 3, if you look. It says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, look, you have to have the mindset of a soldier. And what is a, you know, does a, and here's the way I'd like to apply that, is, is that a soldier doesn't go to war unexpectedly. You know, no soldier goes to boot camp wondering, I wonder what's going to happen next. Well, you're going to go to war. You know, why are you training me to shoot this gun? You know, they never ask that. Why am I being trained to throw a grenade? Or, or why am I being trained as a soldier to apply first aid to a, to a, you know, a fellow soldier who's been wounded? Because they know, they know full well that in all likelihood they're going to end up in a war. They're not, that's, you know, and that's the mindset we have to have. And a lot of Christians today, they, they think that the, 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 they're shocked when, when the enemy starts to fire back. They hear this buzzing sound, zing, go by their head. What was that? Well, that was a bullet. You know, that's the enemy firing back. And that happens spiritually in, in our Christian life. And sometimes if we go into the Christian life thinking that that's not going to happen, you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for it to be sorely disappointed. You know, and it doesn't take very long often to find out that there is some hardness that has to be endured in the Christian life if you're really going to live it for God. I mean, you could go to one of these fun centers and they'll tickle your ear and scratch your back and tell you everything you want to hear and never tell you anything hard, never tell you that you know your 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 sin is you know point out sins or whatever. They will never jump down your throat about anything. It'll just be all grace and love. And I'm all for grace and love, but there's a whole lot more to that. I mean, this book is is pretty big, and it's not all about grace and love. Right. There's a lot of wrath and judgment and 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 chastening, and there's a lot of dear precious promises. And we want the whole thing. But unfortunately today, Christianity in America has gotten to the place where people would say, well, what do you mean I have to endure hardness? This is a foreign concept to them. But this is what we see that Paul is admonishing Timothy to do. He's saying, look, you have to have the mindset of a soldier, meaning you need to go into it expecting to go to war. And you have to be expecting, knowing that hardness lies ahead. You know, you're not going to endure hardness if you're not expecting it. You're not going to be willing to go through the tribulation if you've just got yourself convinced it's never going to come, if right. it's never going to happen. Right. And that's mostly the people that get, that, uh, get, you know, when tribulation and hardness does come and they get uh, by and by, they're offended, is because they, they were never expecting it. So one of the best things we can do in Christian life is even when vibes are good, I understand there's, there's still a storm coming. Yeah. You know, I heard a preacher say once, and I, and I think this is a great saying, and I've, I've thought of it from time to time, is that there's really only three phases to the, to the Christian life. You're either going into a storm, you're either in the middle of a storm, or you're just coming out of one. And that's really it. Right. I mean, you could go through a storm and come out but, you know, and think, well, that's it. Nope, there's another one coming. I mean, you might have some smooth seas for a little while, but life just has a way of doing that. You know, and the Christian life especially, when we have, you know, life is hard enough, but then when you stack on all these spiritual enemies on top of it, right. you know, there's some hardness to be endured in the Christian life. You know, and I don't want anyone to walk out of here, you know, with down in the mouth and feeling all bad for themselves, like, oh, great, you know, I, Brother Corbin just told me that you know, it's just nothing but hardness and hardship from here on out. There's a lot of rejoicing and there's a lot of, you know, good, pleasant and pleasurable things that we enjoy from at the hand of God. And there's dear fellowship and everything else that comes with it. And we serve God and we earn rewards. But, you know, it's two sides of the same coin. You know, we also have to be willing to endure the hardness that comes as well. We, and you know, first so we have to be, first of all, uh, acknowledge the fact that it's real, that it comes, and that it does happen. You know, John said, "Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you." You know, if you get up and actually preach the whole counsel of God, it shouldn't come as a shock to you when people start turning on you 
and people start you know criticizing you and attacking you you know and and some people that it catches them off guard you know they say whoa you know man i was just i'm just going to church and i'm just trying to live my life and all of a sudden i got some family member all over me you know i've i had that several times throughout my life you know where i just they i i wouldn't even bring it up you know i'm at some some family function somewhere and some relative comes over and wants to straighten me out on abortion <laughs> you know because they find i'm a christian it's like, man, I'm just trying to go here and enjoy this function. I'm not, you know, I'm not at a political rally, you know, but that's where that, but it kind of takes you off guard. Well, people are like, hey, I'm going to, you know, jump on this guy about that. You will be attacked. Marvel not if the world hate you. Even it gets to the point where, you know, there's protesters surrounding the church building or, you know, it's the preachers on the 11 o'clock news and, and, and the coworkers and the friends, and everyone are, are saying, wow, you go to that church and they hate you for it, it you know. Or hate you for what you believe out of the Bible. It, it happens. And if it happens, don't marvel at it. You know, you say, oh, that's what the Bible was talking about. That you should be prepared for that. You need to be prepared for that. That way you'll endure that hardness. You know, you'll be prepared for it. I mean, think about that's why a soldier goes through boot camp. So that when the battle comes, they're prepared for it. They don't just pull you off the street, you know, put the uniform on you and ship you off to war. And say, here, you know, go carry this, whatever, what a hundred pound pack around in, in the desert. You know, they condition you, they build you up, they work on you. And that's the same way in the Christian life. We need to, we need to prepare ourselves ahead of time for the, for the hardness that comes. <clears throat> so if we expect the hardness, then we'll be willing to endure the hardness. We'll be more able to. So don't let it come to a shock to you when the, when the persecution comes. I mean, he says in 2 Timothy, I'm getting ahead of myself in verse, chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will of God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, if you're never suffering persecution, you know, in some form, shape, or form, ever, I'm not saying it's a constant thing, but if you just manage to just kind of live your whole life and never go through any persecution, you got to kind of ask yourself, are you really living godly in Christ Jesus? Because the Bible says, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall, all shall suffer persecution. And what is it those everybody that suffer persecution has in common? is that they live godly in Christ Jesus. So if you're living godly, if you're, you know, you're, you're establishing the standards in your life, if you're, if you're living for the Lord, if you're letting this you know, guide your life and how you live your life, you know, persecution is going to come in one shape or form or another. And I've preached sermons about this, and uh, I don't want to take a whole lot of time on that, but be assured that it's going to happen. You know, and if you're prepared, if you are ready to endure that, if you're, if you're not caught off guard, you know, it, and, and, and people want to get, and I want to get the idea that enduring uh, hardship or persecution is just you white knuckling it through the Christian life. You know, I'm just barely hanging on. You know, that's not how we want to live our life. You know, the Bible, Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He didn't say, you, you know, uh, poor, you poor thing. He didn't pity you. He said, you know, pitiful are you when men revile you. He said, you're blessed. He says, that's a good thing. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. That should be our attitude when hardness comes, when the persecution comes. For great is your reward in heaven. Now, you know, humanly speaking, that's easier, easier said than done. But that's why we have these admonitions that remind us so often the word of God to endure hardness. And not only that, to, be, to understand that it's something to rejoice over because our reward is great in heaven. And that we're not the first. He goes on and says, For, the say, for, so, uh, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You know, it's not, you're not the only one that's ever going to go through it. You know, you're not the only one that's going to have that relative that's going to give you the dirty look and make the snide comment. You're not going to be the only one that's been, you know, on the out at work with the other guys because you don't do what they do or talk like they talk. You know, you're not going to be the only lady that goes out in public and gets weird looks because you dress different. You know, not like a, you know what? <laughs> you, you can insert whatever word you want there. You know, you're not going to be the only one that, that's going to hear, are they all yours? You know, because you, you decided not to you, to, you know, to live by what the book says and actually have children. Right. You know, to be fruitful and multiply and you don't use the birth control. And people are going to go, oh, don't you know what causes that? And hear all the stupid remarks that they make. You know, you're not the first one to go through it. And you won't be the last. All they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So we need to understand that. We need to be prepared for that. And we need to endure that. We need to endure that hardness. <coughs> we need to, and he goes on there in verse 4, he says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So again, he's talking about the fact that, 
you know, he says, no man that warreth entangleth himself. So the Christian life, he's kind of likening this onto some, to some, you know, difficult things. I mean, war is not a pleasant thing. And, you know, it, it, and again, people just have this idea that they're in a church picnic. That's what the Christian life is. That it, it's, it's a recreation, you know, the, the, what, it's not a, ba it's not a, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room, was the song I used to hear. You know, and that's, that's the mindset we have to understand. That's what we've signed up for. You've signed up for a, a battle and not just a playtime. So he's saying, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So what we need to do in the Christian life is, you know, we have to fight and we have to war and we have to endure, but we have to understand something. You have to fight God's battles. Because a lot of people get caught up in the wrong, fighting the wrong battle. We need to fight the battles that God has chosen to fight. Right. You know, we know we need to go out and try to lead some political crusade to, to you know, you know, bring about some changes in our laws or something like that. That's not the, the battle that we're called to fight. You know, we're called to fight the battle that God has chosen. And if you would, turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. Familiar per passage of Scripture, but let's look at it again. And remind ourselves of the battle that God has chosen us to fight, for us to fight. He says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You know, that not so that you can stand in a picket line in Washington, D.C., demanding whatever rights. You know, that, there's a time and a place for that. I'm not saying those things are necessarily evil or bad or not worth doing. But the thing is, they should not, we should not do those in lieu of the battle we're called to fight for God. And we find ourselves getting too entangled in that. You know, it can draw us away from the more important battles. You know, I remember when, uh, you know, you know, let me just confess my faults. You know, I, I went and, and, and participated in a Republican rally in 2012 to get <laughs> delegates down to the Florida Republican National Convention. I mean, I went all the way down to Detroit, Michigan and slept in my car to try and get delegates that would represent Ron Paul down there, you know, that would, that would vote him. And I participated in that system. You know what I found out is that system's corrupt and broken right, and that it's not worth fighting for. It's gone. It's being ruled over by, well, well, let's just read it right here. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Right. It's not talking about UFOs, by the way, those high places. Right. Right? <laughs> it's talking about people in high positions of a power. People that are in high, you know, I got friends in high places. You ever heard that saying? He's saying, I, hey, I've got people who have, have got some clout. I know people that can do things, man, you know, that they, they rank, right. right? And that's what I found out down there in 2012, is that this whole system, this, this world system, ultimately is run by the devil. And only the devil's people get in that are going to play ball with his agenda and what he wants to accomplish. <clears throat> so there's no point in me getting so wrapped up in some political crusade, you know, and that takes over people's life, those kinds of things. You know, or what about wrestling against flesh and blood? You know, people just want to, you know, they want to just get involved in the warfares that are going on. These things can wrap up our lives and entangle us. You know, we need to fight the fight that God has called us to do, to, to fight. The, 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 the battle that he wants us to battle. The war that he wants us to war. And that's against the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, how are you going to accomplish that? How are you going to fight that front? Where is the battlefield today that we're going to go fight on? It's, you know where it is? It's where we were this afternoon before church. Right. It's out on the highways and the hedges and the streets and lanes of this city Amen. knocking on doors. That, you know, that's not just something we do routinely just because you know, we're Baptists and that's just what we do. You know, obviously, it, it, there is that element if we, if, if we have to drag ourselves out there. But you know, we should get excited about it because you have to understand something. Amen. When you're out there knocking on the door, you are fighting a spiritual battle. That's right. You're out there with the sword, the word of God, you're the sword of the Spirit, you know, and you're trying to pull down strongholds in people's minds. You're trying to take, you know, and, and bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ and deliver them from the bonds of iniquity. You're trying to deliver them from, you know, the devil and, 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 and uh, you know, hell. You're trying to save those souls. That's way more important than any other battle you can involve in. I don't care what it is. I mean, name the other battle you think that's more important than that. Than snatching a soul from hell out of the, claw, uh, the clutches of Satan himself for all eternity. 
I mean, that's the most important thing anyone could ever do. And that's that we need a war. That's, the, that's why we need to not let the fairs of this life, the cares and the riches of this world creep in and choke the word that we become unfruitful. We need to make guard against that and make sure that we focus on serving God where he wants us to serve him, you know, outwitting the souls. So he goes on in verse 5 and he says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. So what is he saying here? So he's saying, you know, uh, basically, if you don't reap, you don't sow. You know, we could preach this other ways, but really look at what he's saying in the context, right? He's saying, look, you got a war, you got to endure hardness. And he's saying, and if you strive for masteries, you have to strive lawfully. You know, hey, Timothy, you know, you need to go out and strive. You need to go out and work and don't cut corners. Don't try and find some new way of doing things that's going to make it easier on you. Strive lawfully. And a lot of people, especially in this area of soul winning, they've, they've really, they're not striving lawfully. They're striving, but they're really, they, they come up with other cute and unique ways they think that are better that, that to fight God's wars than the way God has designed, uh, d determined to fight them. You know, God lays it out real clear that we are to go out two by two to every, you know, publicly and, and from house to house, daily in the temple, you know, just preaching Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ sent to them two by two before his face. You know, there's a reason why we go out soul winning the way we do. Right. Because, and that's the way, that's the, 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 we need to strive that way because that's the lawful way of doing it. And I'm not saying if you have some other little way of doing it that it's necessarily, you know, bad, but is it the most efficient way? Is it striving lawfully? I mean, people get caught up you know, in all these other ways. They want to do everything but actually go and knock on someone's door and open the Bible. You know, they want to invite them to church. Or they just want to leave a door hanger. Or they want to just bring a bus by. You know, and you know, I know, look, the bus route is great, you know, if your whole goal is just to pick up a bunch of kids and feed them candy and sing silly songs. You know, I, and I did it for seven years. You know, I'm not, this isn't coming out of a vacuum. I, you know, I, I've, I did that. And you want to hear some annoying bus songs, come talk to me. <laughs> I'll, I'll put them in your head. You'll be singing them all the way home, you know. <laughs> I'm in right out, right up, right down, right happy all the time. I'm in right out, right up, right down, right happy all the time. And if you're really good, you can do it backwards. I'm down, right up, right out, right in, right in. Right, oh. right? <laughs> so, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times I'm saying that, right? Now, of course, kids can get saved in the bus route and praise God for that, you know, but is that really the most efficient way of, getting, of fighting God's war, of fighting God's battles? No. But what he's saying here, you know, I'm kind of going off on a tangent there, but what he's saying here is that you need, there is striving involved. There's warring involved. The husband that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You know, don't sit there and expect to get the fruit and to, and to glean if you're not laboring. If you don't reap, you don't sow. You know, it's, a, it's, it's just a, it's a principle. You know, it's just a fact of life. So he goes on in verse 7. He says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Christ, Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Now that's, I mean, again, the theme of this verse is being faithful, or this chapter, excuse me, being faithful and, and focused in the face of adversity. I mean, and did not Paul, is he not just a shining example of that? As somebody who just suffered persecution and adversaries and just the demonic attack and just man attacking him, and yet he remained faithful to the cause of Christ. And he said, you know what? Even unto bonds. He, he suffered as an evildoer, even unto bonds. You know, being imprisoned. Or they're putting chains on his hands and his feet and, and holding him fast in the deepest part of the prison. Or where they're, you know, he's chained to a Roman soldier. He's got to go stand before this, you know, uh, 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 what's his name? Caesar and all, and all of this, you know. But he remained faithful, right? And he, because he understood one thing is that the word of God is not bound. And, you know, we see an example of that today. You know, we see an example of, of God's word not being bound today. I mean, take our pastor, Pastor Anderson, for example. He's, bound, he's banned. He's not bound. He's banned, right, from 30 plus countries right now. You know, and he's trying, and he's working on another one. <laughs> so, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> who, who will it be next? You know, um, but you know, he, but the thing is, is the word bound? No, it's not. I mean, go to the Faithful Word Baptist Church preaching page. Go to the the website. Click the preaching tab. Scroll all the way to the bottom. You'll see a little map at the bottom. Click that. 
and then you'll see everywhere in the world that somebody has downloaded a sermon and you can t you know for whatever length of time you want you can make these there's a filter to adjust it and there's red dots all over the world all over the world because we live in a day and age where we have the internet and you know and that's a great tool that can be used for God that we the word of God can just be you know uh, can just go out and be published throughout all the world like that you know it can just go viral and you know would to God that you know some other preachers in the old IFB would have figured that out yeah. you know actually nowadays we're kind of glad they didn't because all the nonsense and garbage that they're preaching we don't need that spreading any further than it already has you know <laughs> that's another subject for another time but the point I'm trying to make is you know don't be we should suffer trouble we should we should be willing to go through that, endure this, and, and war this war because we understand that no matter what happens to us, the Word of God is going to yield, refer, uh, yield results. It's not bound. It's not going to return unto Him void. It's going to, if the Word of God is preached, whether you know, in contention or, or not, you know, it's, it's going to yield fruit. And uh, we should be grateful for that. We should always keep that in mind, that the Word of God is not bound. So even if we see somebody, you know, like our pastor, for example, who's, you know, being banned and things like that, don't, don't feel bad about that. Like, it's unfortunate, but you know what? It, it, in some ways, it's a kind of a blessing in disguise because people are, interest, uh, people are intrigued by controversy, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And when they hear about this preacher, you know, and he, he shows up on, you know, BBC, and they want to paint him uh, as whatever, and then they hear what he's saying, you know, for every, you know, if every, out of every 10,000 people that watch it, you know, if one person goes and, and checks out the get, you know, checks out the website or the YouTube channel or whatever, and gets saved, well then, praise God. Yeah. The word of God isn't bound. Right. You know, they can paint us however they want, but if it's this that that is what what we're all about, you know, if this is defines us, then go ahead, and put us out there, and let us let them see, and then let the the people that they're trying to sway decide for themselves. So he goes on, he says uh, in verse 10, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So you got to kind of think about that verse. You, you know, uh, what he's saying there is that Paul endures these things for the sake of the elect. Why? That they will get saved. Right? I endure all things for the elect's sake. You say, well, is he, is he talking about people that are already saved? You know, maybe, but I believe he's talking about people that will get saved. That they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus. Because remember, as we talked about Sunday morning, you know, God doesn't predestinate everyone that's going to be saved, but he foreknows who's going to be saved. Mm -hmm. Like when, when he goes into Corinth and he tells Paul, the Lord tells Paul, you know, fear not, for I have much people in this city. And he abode there two years and saw a great work for God done. But he also suffered persecution, right? So God knows aforetime who's going to reject the gospel and who's going to accept the gospel. That doesn't mean he picks and chooses. And again, we preached on that Sunday, so I'm not going to repeat myself too much. But Paul is saying here that he's willing to endure all things because of that fact. Because there's people, you know, there's much elect in Tucson. You know, we should be willing to endure the 105 degree on a Sunday afternoon. Okay, 110 degree. All right, 115 degree. All right. <laughs> It's coming down. <laughs> it was like, you know, we're like, 96. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's beautiful, right? You know? And we usually get a good breeze in the afternoon, but, you know, we should be willing to endure the weather. We should be willing to will endure, you know, someone slamming a door in our face. We should be willing to, will, uh, willing to endure whatever comes our way. Why? Because of the elect that are in this town. Those that, if they would just hear a clear presentation of the gospel, would get saved. You know, and, and so many people, it's unfortunate, they shy away. They're not willing to endure anything. They're not, they're not willing to go through the uncomfortableness of learning how to give the gospel and talk to a total stranger in order, to, in order for the elect's sake. They won't even endure that. They're not willing to endure the hot weather. They're not willing to endure, you know, their time that they could be, you know, at home napping or doing or some project or whatever it is. They have all these, you know, they're not willing to endure all things for the elect's sake, but that wasn't Paul's attitude. And we ought to have the attitude of we're willing to endure all things. So we're not going to get entangled with the affairs of this life. We're going to endure the hardness. We're going to endure all things. Why? For the elect's sake, that they also may obtain salvation. I mean, it'd, be, it'd just be a terrible day if you got to heaven and God said, yeah, I'm glad you got these people saved. But you know what? If, if you just endured this, this, and this, all these other people could have gotten saved. 
There was all these other people that were just surrounded by you, but because you weren't willing to endure, they're in hell now. I mean, that's, that's a terrible thing to have on your conscience. You know, and why was Paul able to say, I am free from the blood of all men? Because he ceased not to teach and preach, because he held nothing back, because he went out daily. And through many tears, you know, he warned every man, warning every man. Why was he able to do all that? Because he endured all things. You know, he didn't just get offended and, 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 and slough off and, and get lazy and just quit the Christian life. He endured all things so that he could, uh, for, the, for the elect's sake. <clears throat> he said, I made myself servant unto all that I may obtain the more. I made all things by all, unto all men that I by all means might save some. He said, I do this for the gospel's sake. That's what he said in 1 Corinthians. And really, you say, well, that, you know, good for Paul. And Paul's just following the example of Jesus. I mean, if Paul's not a good enough example of that, well, what about Jesus? You know, if that, you know, Jesus, he, he, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. I mean, what if Jesus said, well, you know, I don't want to endure the cross. Well, I mean, we'd all be up the creek without a paddle. I mean, we, you know, so, you know, let's endure all things. Our Lord did that for us. I mean, he endured coming down here. And, you know, like it says there, he was rich. Yet for your sakes, he became poor. I mean, he left the glories of heaven and came down, was born in a manger, just lived a very simple life. Didn't have to do any of that. And then, you know, and then, of course, endured the cross and everything that came with that. So he endured all these things for the elect's sake that they might be saved. Now, I want to just stop in a minute because whenever you come, you know, anytime I can spit in this bucket, I'm going to do it. You know, every time I kick this dog, I'm going to do it. Who are the elect, right? Because people will say, well, the elect, that's the Jews. Right? That's the Jews. Who's heard that? The elect means the Jews. Wrong. It doesn't mean the Jews. So go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. When you get in Colossians 3, keep a bookmark. We'll come back in a minute. But in Colossians 3, I'll begin in right, uh, verse 9. It says, lie not one to another. Okay, so he's saying, he's writing to the church of Colossians. He's saying, lie not one to another, to each other. And who is one another? Who are these people? They're saved, born-again believers that are assembling in, in Colossae, right? They're the Colossians. He says, Lie one not, to, not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew. <laughs> okay? That should be a big clue right there that, you know, there is no Greek or Jew. You don't, we, God doesn't think in these terms. Right circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, or free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. So right here, you have him talking to a group of people in the Colossi, the, you know, the Colossians, and he calls them the elect of God. So who are the elect? He's, he's referring to a bunch of Greeks, a bunch of, you know, Gentile believers here as the elect. So let's let the Bible define itself. Let's not let you know, Nelson Darby or, or Schofield or anybody else tell us what the Bible means. That's right. Let's go to the Word of God and read it for ourselves. You know, if a preacher gets up and, and says this is what the Bible says, then he, we should be able to go to the Bible and see that for ourselves yeah. Yeah. and not need somebody's notes or commentary or, you know, their stupid diagram to explain to us who the, who the elect are. Because right. it says right here that the Colossians were to put on, therefore, as the elect of God, Holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Go over to Romans chapter 8. I mean, the Bible just over and over again refers to Gentile believers as the elect of God. And it's not because they're elect and the Jews aren't. It's because those that are elect are those that have believed in Christ, that have put their faith in Christ, whether Jew or Greek. You know, if a Jew rejects Judaism and gets saved, guess what? He's the elect. Yeah. But it's not because he's a Jew. It's because he did the one thing that we all must do to become the elect in Christ, which is to believe in Christ. And, you know, it's just stupid that preachers that, that, that claim to believe this book still get up today and, and, and can't see that and understand that for themselves. And look at uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, for us, right? He's writing to the Romans, for us. Who can be against us? Uh, Romans 8.31, sorry. Verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Right? So he's talking to us, right? right. Uh, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
Who shall lay anything to God's of God, charge of God's elect? So he's referring to us, 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 God's elect. But the dispensation would have you believe that, that in, in, in verse 33, it's just a hard change. He's talking about us, he's talking about us, he's talking about us in the verse 33. But who shall lay anything to the charge of the Jews? That doesn't even make sense in that passage, to read it that way. That would be, I mean, Paul, we'd, we'd say what's wrong with Paul that he hit his head when he wrote this. You know, that it, grammatically doesn't even make sense. So he's saying us, 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 and then he calls us God's elect. It is God that justifies. Go to Romans chapter 11. I'll read to you 1 Thessalonians 1. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Thessalonians. Hmm. Sounds like a Greek city to me. You know, sounds like not a Jewish town. Yeah. And he calls them the elect of God, the election of God, that they were to know their election of God. Romans 11, 7. Romans 11, 7. What then? You know, and this is the nail in the coffin. If you can read this verse and walk away and still think that the Jews are God's elect, I don't know what else to tell you. You know, you should, electroshock therapy might be <laughs> what you need. Or, you know, or stop getting electroshock therapy. Or maybe, you know, get off the meds or something. I don't know. Because this is crystal, crystal clear. What then? Israel hath not obtained what she seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it. So who are the elect? They have, they're the ones that have obtained what they seeketh for, and the rest were blinded, right? So how can you say Israel hasn't attained it, but they have attained it? That, that, you know, most, I don't think I have to sit here and expound this verse to everyone in the room. Because it's really clear what it's saying here. And it makes it very clear that Israel is not the elect. You know, that, you know just because you're, you know, they are not all Israel which are of Israel. <coughs> you know, neither they, you know, you know, the true Jews are those which are Jews inwardly. Yep. Whose circumcision is that of the heart and not of the flesh. Right. Whose praises of God and not of men. So... <coughs> You know, I, I think I made that pretty clear, you know, from the Bible. And it didn't take that long, did it? Nope. To just go to some passages and show us where God is referring to us as Gentile believers as the elect. Right? right? And specifically calls Israel not the elect. So, but still some people, they just can't, they don't get it. And then, you know, normally with those people, if you dig a little deeper, you find out they don't believe the right gospel anyway. And that's probably where they have a problem because these things are spiritually discerned goes on in verse 11 it says it's a faithful saying go back to first timothy or second timothy chapter 2 he says it is a faithful saying for if we be dead with him we shall also live with him if we suffer we also shall reign with him if we deny him he also will deny us if we believe not yet he abideth faithful he cannot defy, deny himself so again you know i know we're kind of coming back and forth to this passage but you have to keep all this in mind that it's all one thing. Keep it in context. What's the context? That we are to endure. That we are to endure hardness. That we are to war a good warfare. We're to uh, be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. And he, what he's saying here is if we suffer, we also shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. What he's trying to get across is that God is faithful to us, isn't he? God said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? God is going to be faithful to us no matter what. Amen. You know, if we're saved, even if we deny him, Yet he abideth faithful. You know, if we're saved we, and, and, and we say, well, you know, and, and, and we're ashamed of Christ. We, 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 you know, we, we, as the song says, you know, we blush to speak his name. You know, we deny him in the presence of men. Does that mean we lose our salvation? Nope. No, we still have it. But God's going to be ashamed of us as well. He will deny us, you know. You know, if, you, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we refuse to suffer, because what's it say in verse 12? If we suffer, we shall reign with him if we deny him. So the denying here is not, you know, a rejecting of Christ, but it's a denying of saying, look, I'm not going to identify with Christ right now because it could cost me something. Then we then he also will deny us. What does that mean? What is it that he's going to deny us? That salvation? No, he'll deny us the rewards. As he said in Matthew 5, for great is your reward in heaven. You know, if if you bless, if you rejoice that when men revile you and persecute you. You know, if you're willing to suffer, if we suffer, we shall reign with him. We'll have those rewards. You know, but if we deny him, he's going to deny us. Not in the sense that he's going to say, I never knew you. He's going to deny us the rewards that we could have had. He's going to say, oh, you're going to deny me before men? Well, then I'm going to deny you before my holy angels. You know, you're not going to get that crown of, you know, whatever, the rejoicing. So what this is saying here is that God is faithful to us and he expects us to do the same. And I don't think that's much, you know, he's asking too much. You know, God is faithful to us. He's given us, you know, the riches of glory in Christ Jesus. 
Mm -hmm. You know, he's given us eternal life. That's right. And he just wants us to be willing to endure hardness here. That's what this chapter is about. Uh, we, you know, there's more in Luke 9, but for sake of time, we're just going to, we're going to move along here. And he says in verse 14, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to subverting of the hearers. So again, if we're going to put a title on the sermon besides just 2 Timothy 2, it was going to be, you know, faithfulness and focus in the faith, face of adversity. So far, we've kind of looked at that faithfulness, right? He's telling him to remain faithful, don't deny him, endure the hardness, be willing to suffer the persecution, you know, don't get entangled in the affairs of life. We, we've kind of looked at that faithfulness part. Now he's also re reminding Timothy of that second part. He's like, hey, you need to remain focused on the goal. You know, yeah, be faithful to Christ, don't deny him, but make sure that you're focused on what really matters in life and that you're not going to get caught up and, uh, and distracted by, you know, these things that we're about to talk about. He says there in... Uh, Verse 14, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. You know, and you run into this a lot in, in, in Christian circles even, where people want to just start nitpicking about words to no profit, right? And Titus, if you would, go to Titus chapter 3, verse 8. He was given the exact same instruction by Paul to not strive about words to no profit. Excuse me. <clears throat> he says to strive not against uh, to words to no profit to the subverting of, pre of the hearers that's what he said to Timothy but look there in Titus 3 verse 8 where he says the same thing this is a faithful saying and if these things uh, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly so what did he say in Timothy to put them in remembrance and he's saying here affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works so he wants them to remain focused on the task right these things are good and profitable unto them, but avoid foolish questions, right? So it's the same instruction, basically. He's saying, look, they need to aff affirm them constantly, to, to, aff to maintain good works, and to avoid foolish questions. So you can kind of see how it's the same set of instructions he gave Timothy, where he said, you know, put them in remembrance, charge them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to profit, to the subverting of the hearers. You know, basically, we don't want to get, we don't want to lose focus, and we don't want to get distracted by, you know, heretics and everything else that, that, that comes down the pike. We don't want to spend most of our time battling online. You know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna win the world to Christ by, through YouTube comments. You know, that's not how it's going to work. You know, that, that, that's to no profit. Those are words to no profit. It's just a bunch of strife. It leads nowhere. <laughs> so, how do you practice this? You know, how do we practically apply this? Well, one thing would be for anyone that's, you know, going to be preaching, would we should preach things that will edify and instruct. You know, as preachers, we should seek to edify the body of Christ. I mean, that's what the purpose of preaching is and teaching the Word of God. is to build up the saints, to perfect the saints, and to not preach things that are foolish questions. To not preach things that are just striving about words to no profit. You know, and, and, and there's some topics, I think, that, I mean, they're out there. It's just foolish to even, I mean, you mention them from the pulpit, okay, but to devote a whole sermon to subjects like, you know, the UFOs or things like that, or whatever, some crazy, weird thing that people believe out there. You know, I, I just think there's better things. You know, if some, hey, if someone's struggling in the church, you know, if it's, a, real, if it's a, a thing that's going on in the church that needs to be preached against, by all means, preach it. You know, if somebody's out there, you know, trying to hunt down Nessie over in Loch Ness, you know, <laughs> you know, they're planning a trip, like maybe sit them down and say, look, it's, you know, it was just, a, it, the photo was just a swan's <laughs> neck, you know, you ever wonder why every photo of Loch Ness is grainy, you know, you know, why don't they have a clear photo, you know, but see, see what I'm saying? Like I could start going off on Loch Ness right now, couldn't I? You know, the old Nessie, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but would that be profitable to you? Would that? Would you guys walk out of here like, man? I'm glad he shored me up on on Loch, <laughs> on Loch Ness monster. You know, <clears throat> now I have theories about the Loch Ness monster, but this is not the place to discuss it, right? So we shouldn't be caught up in things that are, you know, words without profit. You know, things that are foolish questions. You know, well, what, what's the difference between the white alien and the gray alien? You know, break the. And you think this is funny, but there's there's preachers out there they do that. They have, they have whole theories devoted to aliens and, 
you know, moon bases and all this weird stuff. <laughs> so that would go for preachers, right? So that's like applies to one guy in the room, okay? <laughs> but what about everybody else, you know? <clears throat> Don't get distracted at the door would be one. I would, I would admonish people to do. You know, this is when we could all apply, you know, when we go out soul winning is avoid foolish questions, you know, and don't strive about words to no profit. You know, and somebody, I, I had a guy Sunday, and somebody on the way back from the, in the van said, I feel like this is gonna end up in a sermon. And sure, yeah, it was, <laughs> <laughs> well, here it is, brother. <laughs> he was right. I had this guy at the door, last door we knocked on Sunday, and I knock on his door, and you know, I tell him I'm from a Baptist church, and he's all like, what Baptist church you from? You know, <laughs> and uh, I tell him which one. He's like, he, got, he was kind of like checking me out, you know. And then when he heard I was Baptist, he's like, he's like, he was going to grace me with his time at that point and kind of tell me what's what, you know. And anyway, so I just told him, you know, I said, well, you know, we believe that salvation is by grace through faith, you know. And I asked him what he believed. He said, yeah, you got to, you got to believe, but you got to maintain the works or something like that. He believed you had to like still live a good life or something. And it was funny because one of the first things I asked him was, well, are you going to church anywhere? He's like, nope. I visit from time to time. I'm like, okay. So then I kind of, he kind of said something or I was like, this guy's trusting in his work. So then I kind of made a point of saying, well, you know, a person doesn't have to do anything but believe in Christ. And he's like, well, you know, I don't believe that. And he, but the thing was, he was like, well, you know, you're kind of contradicting yourself. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, you're telling me it's all through grace, but here you are out inviting people to church, trying to get me to come to church. And I'm just going like, did I miss something? <laughs> You know, did I eat a bad taco before I came out here or something? <laughs> you know, like I didn't, it didn't make, it doesn't even make sense what you just said. And on the way back, we're coming back, I'm thinking about it, I'm like, that's such a dumb statement. I mean, here's a guy who's saying, you, you know, you have to live a good life. You're not, you just admit it, you're not even in church, buddy. Right. <laughs> you don't even go to church, you know, and, and but he, he, here's the guy who's saying, look, you know, you got to do works, you know, and he's not knocking on anyone's door. He's right. not even going to church. Right. And here's a guy who's saying it's all by grace through faith, but I'm the one out knocking the doors. Right. <laughs> you know, what do you do with that? Do you stand at the door and strive with that guy? No, you try to give him the YouTube card, which he rejected. Well, your track's good enough. <laughs> you know, if I'm interested, I will look you up. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we meet over on the east side of town. Right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey, hopefully he shows up and gets right, but... You know, what do I, I'm just like so frustrated. I could sit there and be like, hey, let me break it down for this guy and tell him where he's wrong and straighten him out. And, you know, maybe there's a time and place for that. And you got to kind of develop a sense for that. But, you know, most of the time people that are just making ignorant, stupid statements like that, don't strive about words to no profit. Just move on to the next door. Say, okay, thanks. Have a nice day. Because you know what? The guy next door wants to hear the gospel. But I'm over here trying to straighten this guy out on, whatever doctrine or whatever false belief and look there's a time and place for it but if it's just if it's just striving to words to no profit if it's just foolish questions that are that same day i had some guy i was like i was like so he says you know when you receive jesus christ you have everlasting life now how long do you think everlasting is well it's a period of time <laughs> that's what the guy told me i've never heard anyone say this i said yeah it's, he says i wouldn't call it eternal i'm like well, you know i literally was like <laughs> uh, what? Like, I didn't even know what to say to that. Well, it's a period of time. And it just goes to show you that we've all existed. I was like, well, Jesus said you must be born again. You had to be born of the water and of the Spirit. I mean, I tried to kind of get it back on track. But when I hear something as stupid and foolish as that, and that guy's whole demeanor is just like, well, I'm just going to, you know, I've got this inside knowledge on, you know, what the Greek word really means. That kind of guy, whatever. You know, like just trying to outwit me or, you know, flex intellectually, which you failed at, by the way, because that doesn't even make sense. You know, it's a period of time. Yeah, it's forever. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again, but what did I do? You know, break out the, the smartphone. Well, let's, let's get to the bottom of what this word means. <laughs> no, it's like, okay, I can see you're just a guy who just, you know, is vainly puffed up in, the, in your own mind. Let me just give you a YouTube card and admonish you, quote you a verse and pleasantly walk away with a smile on my face and then preach about you. <laughs> you know, I get it off my chest later, you know, after I've let it stew for a while. No, but, but that's the point I'm trying to make here, you know, is that we shouldn't be getting distracted and, and, and we should be careful to maintain good works. We should do the soul winning. But let's, not, let's avoid foolish questions while we're doing it, amen? Let's avoid, 
getting caught up, you know, and, and trying to like, you know, right every wrong on the internet. You know, don't, I don't even bother with the comments anymore. Don't even go there, you know, because it's, it's mean. <laughs> Get my f I'm too sensitive to go over and look, right? Someone might say something like, I have a fat dwarven face, and then <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I'm going I'm to have a complex. But he goes on in verse 15. Let's move on for sake of time. He says, Study to show thyself a proof unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that's the siren call of the dispensationalist. Yeah. You need to rightly divide. And it isn't ironic the people that quote this verse the, mo the most have it so wrong. They end up. They don't divide the word. They like they smear it all over the place, and they don't. They, it doesn't. They can't make heads or tails of it, and they have to have somebody else come along and divide it for them. They're not studying to show themselves approved unto God. You know, they they're leaning on all these other men. They're leaning on their you know sixty plus volume of Ruckman or however many books he wrote. I don't know. You know, they've got they've got the greatest book of dispensational uh, the the greatest book ever written on dispensational. Literally the title of the book. The greatest book ever. The greatest book on dispensationalism ever written by uh, Clarence Larkin. How do you know that? Because a long time ago, I ordered that book and tried to read it, and I said, this is no. Start talking about pre-Adamite man and how they're demons today, and there's a difference. Between, it, it goes, it's crazy. They get into crazy, weird stuff, right? And it's just, it's ironic that they're saying, well, no, you guys aren't di rightly dividing the word because they aren't the ones rightly dividing the word. And they're not studying to show themselves approved of God. They're leaning on everybody else. All these other men with all their charts and all of their books to tell them what the Bible means. No one's going to go into the Bible and read it with the Holy Spirit as their guide and, 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 and have him lead you into all truth. You're not going to just read this book on your own and walk out saying, there's seven dispensations of time in which God dealt with man in different ways. And in the Old Testament was works, and in the future it will be, it'll be grace and works. And You're not going to walk away from the Bible with that. Yeah, right. The only way you're going to get that is if you get some heretic to come alongside you and whisper in your ear and tell you, oh, this is what it means, and tell you how, and explain it to you that way. And twist scripture and rest scripture and, and, make, and come up with these, these false doctrines. So, but we are to divide the word, aren't we? So how should we divide the word? Well, it's actually not that difficult. One, one division of the word, uh, word of God is Old Testament and New Testament. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. We need to make, learn how to make that division. Right. What things are done away in Christ and what things in the Old Testament that have, are still remain and are ap applicable today. You know, there's certain things that we're not uh, held accountable that we're, uh, we would have been held accountable for in the Old Testament. Keeping the Sabbath days, doing the sacrifices, these things. You know, the Bible says now, you know, that no, let no man judge you, therefore, meat or drink or respective and holy day. Those things are done away in Christ. He hath nailed them, uh, the handwriting of ordinances has been nailed with him to the cross. It's been taken out of the way. And they're very specific things. There being also a change in the, uh, 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 in the priesthood, there's made, uh, there also being a change in the law, there's also of necessity a change, it's backwards. You know, there's a change in the priesthood, therefore, there is a change in the law. Right, God is Christ has come. He's 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 done away with the temple. The veil was rent in two. Right. There are certain things that are done away in Christ. That's another division between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. You know, a lot of people would do well to just start right there. You know, go ahead and have the bacon. Go ahead and eat the shellfish. Yeah. You know, please. <laughs> How about each book is a division? Yeah. Look at e each book is its own book unto itself. Right? And, 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 and we should understand the theme of each book. That would be a great way, you know, especially in the New Testament, if we could go through and understand what every book was about. Or even better, each chapter. Each chapter is divided for you in the Word of God. Understanding what each chapter is about. Summarizing it. But really, the best way to do this, if you would, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, is to compare the Bible with the Bible. You want to know how to rightly divide the Word of God? As to know what, what applies and what doesn't, what's done away, and what is, is to compare the Bible with the Bible. Let it define it for you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'll begin in verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of, uh, which is of God. So he's saying, look, we can know the things of God because we've received the spirit of God. 
that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things we also, also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, you know, Darby, Schofield, that's man's wisdom, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You know, we define our term, we define our doctrine based on the Bible. You know, we let, let the Bible, you know, uh, define what we believe. We compare spiritual things with spiritual. So that is, that's one way to divide the Word of God, to make sure you're not you know, falling into false doctrine. Go, look there at verse 16 in, in back in 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 16, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So he's saying, look, you need to study for yourself, show yourself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and, and shun and profane vain and babblings. What is he saying? Stay focused. You need to stay focused. We need to remain faithful, but then we need to stay focused. We need to be willing to endure the hardness, but we need to stay focused on doing things the right way. He's saying, stay focused. He says, shun profane and vain babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. You know, don't get caught up with all the, the, the vain jangling that's out there. And he says, And their word will eat as doth the canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So what is he saying there? He says to shun. That means you don't engage in debate. I mean, that's what it means to shun something. Not to make a point of going out and telling them that they're wrong. You know, we don't have to go and correct everybody. You know, and, the, and, you know, the, 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 the Internet is a two-edged sword. YouTube is a two-edged sword. It's great that, that we, we can get our message out, but the other, the, pro, the, the other side of that sword is everybody else gets their message out too. You know, we live in a day where every idiot can get on the Internet and just express his opinion as if he's some kind of authority just because he's on the Internet. You know, and, and so we should shun profane and vain babblings. This applies today. Don't get caught up in just having to go out there and try and straighten out every idiot on the internet yeah. you know and i say that because i know it happens because i know i've done it i know i spent hours going back and forth with with morons on the internet trying to correct them on bible because i know i'm right because i have the spirit of god i know this book and I've, I've read it it's right there it's black and white but here's the thing they increase unto more ungodliness it says why should you shun these things because of the reasons given they, for they increase unto more unga ungodliness. Look, there will never be a lack of fools. There will never be a lack of people to argue with on the internet or at the door or wherever. There will never be people, a, a lack of those people. <laughs> they, will always, they will increase unto more ungodliness. And you know what? They'll just lead you down. N next thing you know, you, know you're, you're start, you're, you start out to defend you know, eternal security. And then you're, you know, you're out there. They've got you trying to prove the earth is not flat. Or some silly thing like that. It improve. It just increases under more ungodliness. It's a rabbit hole that you can just. There's no end to it. And it says their word doth eat as a canker. You know they're not going to receive correction. You can't stop it. You know it increases. You know it's like it, it, it eats as a canker, like a cancer, right? It's not going to go into remission. It's not going to go away. Their word's going to continue to spread. Their foolishness. Their, their, their vain and profane babbling is just going to continue to go on and on and on. So we should shun it. That's the best way to deal with it is just to say, I want nothing to do with it and focus on what really matters. Enduring the hardness, doing the work of God, doing what matters for Christ and not trying to you know, engage in every foolish debate that we come across. Basically, you know, the Bible says, and I was going to have you turn there, but just listen. It says in Proverbs 26, verse 4, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. Right? So it tells us very clearly in Proverbs 26, verse 4, Answer not a fool according to his folly. Right? But the very next verse says, Answer a fool according to his folly. You know, maybe you do want to turn there. I don't know. Cause, but but if, you're, if you can get that, it, you, one verse is telling us don't answer a fool. The very next verse and tells us answer a fool. What it's telling us is that you have to pick your battles wisely. You know, we need to understand who deserves to be shunned and who deserves to be rebuked, right? Because he says, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. You know, if you just fall into this trap of just going back and forth tit for tat with some fool who's never going to accept correction, you know, it, it doesn't lead anywhere. And now you both look like a couple of fools. Because now you just look like a guy who spends a lot of time on the internet arguing with fools, you know? 
<clears throat> but he says, answer a fool in verse 5, according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. So there is a time to answer a fool according to his own folly, correct him, straighten out where he's wrong, and that time is when he's wise in his own conceit. When you're dealing with this, this puffed up and proud guy who, just, who needs to be corrected publicly. And really, you know, if you're going to answer a fool, you should be putting him to shame instead of arguing him. You know, he says, lest he be wise in his own conceit. You, it's, you would argue the fool not to, to try and just, you know, prove yourself right, but really to just prove him wrong and to take him out at the legs so he doesn't have a leg to stand on. And really, you know, a recent example that I, as I was writing this that I thought of was that video that Pastor Anderson just put out about that guy that was trying to debunk mar marching design. Who saw that? You know, went up on the Faithful Word Baptist Church channel where Pastor just goes through the video yeah. and point, points out all the error on this guy. Sure. And just all the stupidity. Now, why did he? That guy's a fool. Yep, that guy that made that video trying to debunk it is an unsaved fool. Yep, but Pastor Anderson answered him, right? And here's why: because that guy was wise in his own conceit. You know, he's out there making a public video, and he's trying to, you know, and he's very puffed up and very proud. And that guy needed to get cut down. Yep. You know, and he's probably a guy that might have actually. I don't know who exactly the guy was, but I, you know, another example would be that uh, other guy over at West Coast Baptist College that just called out for being a yeah. work salvation homo sympathizing, uh, getcher. yeah, getcher, getch, yeah. getch, getcha gumi, whatever, <laughs> you know, John Getch, yeah. I think it was, right, the the big wig over there, the right hand man to Paul Chapel, yeah. who was preaching a full blown work salvation. Right. And telling people to and just that we should just be accepting of homos, yep. and that anybody that says anything crass or mean to them is not right with God, that they're the vile ones, yeah. you know. And and uh, that guy got called out yep. and publicly rebuked from from a pulpit, and rightly so. Yep. And that guy's an unsafe fool as well. Yep. And and why why is that? Because that guy was wise in his own conceit. He had a lot of influence on people, yep. you know. And people need they need you know. There's a big difference between a calling out a guy like that and rebuking a fool like that than, you know, uh, avatar name, uh, user 14367 on, you know, whatever stupid name they come up with out there. I don't want to mention any of them that I might think of because they're going to, they love to hear their names mentioned. <laughs> you know, the fake YouTube account, you know, the William Wallace or whatever, <laughs> just with like a Braveheart picture who's... You know, just some anonymous fool who has no influence over anybody that's just sitting in his mom's basement somewhere trolling the internet. Right. That guy should just be avoided. You know, so that's the difference. We need to pick our battles wisely. We don't need to rebuke every fool we come across. Right. But these big, you know, the, you know, the guys that need it are the ones that are wise in their own conceit. And uh, they have a lot of people telling, a lot of yes men around them. They need to get straightened out. So I thought of those examples, but let's just move along here and we'll wrap it up. In verse 18, he says, Who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So again, it kind of goes back to that first verse. We're to be shunning these people, right? We're, we're, we're to shun the profane and vain babblies. We are to depart from iniquity, these type of people. So... <clears throat> He says here that we should uh, we we are departing from iniquity, and he says here it's something that we should do. You know, it, it's something that uh, uh, it's not. Let me just move on here. But he says uh, uh, we should basically what he's saying here is that we should depart from bad company, right? There's some people that you're just supposed to depart from, that we just shouldn't have anything to do with them. He says, let everyone that name uh, name the name of the Christ depart from iniquity. Now, some people say, well, you're, that means that you're spot, supposed to quit sinning. Well, yeah, you are. Right? We should stop sinning. We should stop trying to quit doing that. We're never going to be completely without sin in this Christian life. But what he's saying here is that you are to depart from those that are wicked. That's what's being, that's the context here. Okay? Because he's saying, you know, shun profane and vain babblings. You know, and he names Hymenus and Philetus. He says they have erred concerning the truth. And he says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. You know, he knows who are his own. So let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from the heretic. Does that make sense? Yeah. Depart from the Hymenatus and Philetus of this right. world. Shun the profane vein and vain babblings. It's not, he's not saying, you know, you need to quit sinning. 
that's out of context. That's just like a hard shift. Yeah. That's like you're, you know, you're going from first gear to sixth. You know, that, that's, not, that's not what it's saying here. He's saying, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity in the sense that we are to separate from those that are preaching heresy. We are to shun profane and vain babblings. <coughs> he says, in verse 20, carries on in that context. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some honored, and to some to dishonor. And he says, if a man therefore purge himself from these, right, not of these, if a man purge himself from the vessels of dishonor, right, he separates, he shall be a vessel unto honor, because he's not like them, right? Flee also youthful lusts. So it's departing from these other things, departing from the, the Hymenaeus and Philetus is departing from uh, the, the, the vessels of dishonor. He goes on, flee also youthful us, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, and peace from them that call on the Lord. With them that call uh, on the Lord out of a pure heart. He's saying, look, flee, flee the club. Flee the bar. Flee from the, you know, the, the, the well, there's nothing but iniquity waiting for you. Those that are going to just pursue youthful lusts. Those that are just, you know, be lascivious and those that are just going to try and to fall, get you to fall into sin. Purge yourself from these, he's saying here. You know, shun the profane and vain babblings. Purge yourself from vessels of dishonor. Don't have anything to do with them. And flee these things. And, and, you, <coughs> and he's talking about fleeing from people and fleeing from and purging ourselves from com bad company. Because he says there, flee all the useful us, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them. So it's, it, we're separating from one company and joining on to another. You know, and I remember reading this. This, was a, this verse was like a big turning point for me in my Christian life early on. Is that, you know, I had a lot of worldly, ungodly friends that were always trying to drag me back into just continuing on in my ungodliness, you know, partying and everything that goes along with it. And I remember reading that and saying, look, this is what God wants for me to do. And it's not, <clears throat> it's not you know, keep company with both. Or try to drag your friends along with you. It doesn't work that way. And I even had a friend call me out on it. He says, look, you can't come to these parties and preach Christ while, with a beer in your hand and doing everything else that you do. That's right. He's like, you need to choose. Now, to his, to, to his chagrin, I chose Christ. I said, well, you're right. And I ditched my old friends. Right. you know. And they were kind of like, whoa, taken aback by that. But you know what? I went ahead and I, went and I pursued. The, I fleed these things and I followed after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord of a pure heart. Got in church, right. you know. One of the best ways to get the sin out of your life is to get in church. Amen. You know, that's the problem people make in so many areas of their life is they try to get rid of something, but they never replace it with anything. You know, they say, well, I'm going keep, keep, I'm gonna to uh, quit keeping company, bad company, and I'm just going to go live like a hermit by myself. That's not going to work either. You know, you need to get with good company. You need to get in church. You need to make new friends who have godly interests that can encourage you and inspire you and motivate you to serve God. He goes on and says, Foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. So he's kind of wrapping it up here by just saying, look, you know, get with the right company, Avoid the foolish questions. Flee the youthful lusts. And, and he's saying here, and don't strive. And this is really something that we have to take to heart. Is that we don't want people that strive. You know, like, for instance, we don't want to be getting involved in debates. You know, because it's, it, you, know, you know, that's something that reprobates are full of. The Bible doesn't promote debates. It promotes not striving. Being gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. Patient. These are the characteristics that we want to have. We don't want to be people that are just out, you know, just trying to get in debates, trying to get in arguments, feeling like we always have to prove our side right. You know, if somebody's wrong about something, if, they're, if they've got it wrong, you know, we don't have to be this, this spiritual justice warrior. Where we're going to go out and just make everybody right because it's not going to happen. And you're just going to end up spinning your wheels. And you're going to waste your time. But, you know, we don't, so we don't want to have this warring attitude we must not strive. We have to be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patience. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You know, a lot of times we take it personally at the door when somebody, you know, comes back at us with something. But you have to understand something. They're only fighting themselves. 
you know, if someone wants to try and straighten you out on some doctrine in the door or tell you how salvation is, is, isn't all by grace, that you still have to do X, Y, or Z, they're not a, that's not going to affect you. They're not going to take your salvation. You know what I mean? It's not like you're going to walk away from that door and be like, yeah, maybe I'm, you know, all of a sudden I'm unsaved. They're opposing themselves right. when they're rude, when they, when they want to argue. The only person they're fighting is themselves. Yeah. We're already saved. Right. That's what I told that guy I was referring to earlier. I said, I go out, he said, well, you're out here trying, you know, you seem contradictory because you're trying to get me to come to church, but you want to tell me it's a gift. I said, I'm not doing this to go to heaven. Right. I'm doing this so you go to heaven. Because right. I want others to go to heaven. Right? right? I'm not... He, they're opposing themselves and we need to be keep that in mind and so that we're gentle apt to teach patient you know and on a high note you know what I told that guy I said God bless you have a good day I hope God does bless him I really do I hope God opens the eyes of his understanding and causes him to, to realize that he is unsaved right. and that he believes the gospel I don't need to feel vindicated and see that guy go to hell and say, oh, now I, you see, see, I, see, I was right. right. You were wrong. Ha, ha, ha. That's not my attitude. Right. You know, I'm not out there to, to vindicate. I don't need somebody to, to uh, vindicate me or put their stamp of approval on me. I don't need that because I've got the Holy Ghost. I already know I'm right. I want them to stop opposing themselves. How are we going to do that? By being meek, by not striving, by being gentle, by being apt to teach, being able to just show them, well, here's where you're wrong. That's what the Bible says. And if they reject this, then there's nothing more we can do. We'll move on to the next door. If God preadventure will give them the repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that's is what we should want. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That's who we're fighting for. That's the gospel that we're fighting for. That's what we're trying. Uh, that's the warfare that we're warring. Is trying to help people recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. That's the fight that we're supposed to be fighting. And really, this just kind of wraps up, you know, showing us that, you know, we all need to remember that we were also once unsaved. Yeah, right. You know, we were once also that guy that had some stupid idea about what it takes to get to heaven. Yeah. We were also that once, perhaps, that proud, contentious, arrogant, condescending individual that we run into at the door. That might have been us to some degree or another. You know, I remember when I got saved, one of, the, my, one of my relatives said, the you of today would laugh at the you. Or the you of, of, of a year ago would be laughing and making fun of the person you are now. I said, you're right. That doesn't change anything. <laughs> and we have to understand that, that someone had to come along and do the exact same thing for us. Amen. They had to be meek, they had to be patient, and they had to be willing to teach us the gospel. And we need to do the same for others. There's others out there. They need to be instructed. They need to be taken out of the devil's clutches. They need to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. And it's up to us. That's our battle to fight. You know, but we don't go out there with guns a-blazing. We go out there gently, meekly, patiently instructing them. You know, and it's our duty to be faithful and endure the hardness that comes with the Christian life so that we can go out and fight this fight for the gospel's sake. Let's go ahead and close it in the word of prayer.